Take your Bibles and turn as quickly as you can to the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Thank you, thank you for being here this morning. It's a wonderful thing to be back. And man, we always love to come here. A lot has happened here since we've been here, and a lot has happened in our lives since we've been here. We're now up to 40 grandchildren since we left here. We have three greats since we were here. And uh, man, they're just coming all along, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and uh, by the way, do you know what the world's record for having babies is for one woman? It happened years ago, and uh, the McGinnis World Book of Records has it recorded, in case you've never seen it, it's recorded there. And this is not a joke now, I'm telling you the truth. And uh, the Lancet, which is one of the world's foremost medical journals, did a study on this woman to find out why she was so prolific. And uh, I've never read all the articles, but they said it was amazing. And by the way, this was years ago before the day of artificial everything, you know, no pills, no, no anything to help anybody have a baby. And I have the record here. Her name was Valentina Veslev. And uh, she lived near, uh, near the monastery, near, um, well, let's see here, Mo near Moscow. She lived near, she was Russian, lived near Moscow. And um, the, she, they were Catholic. She was a member of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church kept an accurate record of all the names. And then, of course, uh, her husband verified all the children when he was in his 70s and gave all their names and so forth. By the way, she was still in good health at 75 years of age. Um, and uh, you say, well, how many babies did she have? Well, she had 27, what they called in those days, 27 detainments. Now, that means she went in to have a baby 27 times. Uh, that's not you know, that's not beyond imagination. Girls get married as young as 15, 14, 15. Uh, you could perceive a possibility of 27 different times to have a baby, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was she never had a single baby. She had 16 sets of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quadruplets for a total of 69 children. And she... On, and this is an amazing thing, only two of them died in infancy. So she raised 67 of those 69 children. And, uh, you know, I'll tell this from place to place, and, and I'll see the women go, uh, oh, you know. uh, well, you know, between us, Rhonda and I have 10. Uh, when we were having children, uh, we, of course, we got up to seven, we were accused of being like the couple who went to their pastor. And uh, he said, Past they said, Pastor, we've been married several years and we don't have children and we, we, would, we would like to have a child to raise for the Lord. He said, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't. They said, well, we don't know what the problem is and well, we have no babies in our home yet. And he said, she said, well, the reason we're here, we would like to ask you to pray for us. He said, I'll be more than glad to. She said, would you anoint us with oil and pray for us? Well, he said, I'd sure, I'd be glad to. So he opened his desk drawer to get his little bottle of sweet oil that he kept there, but it was gone. One of the children had been in his office and playing and took it, misplaced it, and he couldn't find it. And so uh, he buzzed his secretary, and he said, uh, uh, Maud, I need some oil. She said, some what? He said, some oil. She said, I don't have any. He said, I didn't ask you whether you had it or not. I need some oil. I, I go, to the, go to the furnace room and get motor oil. Go to the kitchen and get Wesson oil. I don't care what kind of oil. I got to have some oil. Well, a little, little bit, she come roaring in there, her hair all frayed, come roaring in there with a little can of three-in-one oil. Now, don't get ahead of me, okay? And uh, so he took this oil, put a little bit on his finger, and rubbed it on the man's forehead right here. And he took a little more and rubbed it on the lady's forehead right here. And, of course, that was a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God as taught in the book of James and so forth. And so, anyway, uh, then he knelt and prayed that they could have a baby. Well, ten months later, she gave birth to, guess what? 
triplets, after being anointed with three and one. Well, he was afraid to go see her, afraid that she would be upset after he anointed her with three and one oil and she had triplets. But so finally he went in and when he walked in the room, she looked over at him and busted out praising the Lord. I mean, tears of joy and laughing. Woo! She was having, he said, well, sister, I'm so glad to know you got a good attitude after I anointed you with three and one oil and you had triplets. Oh, she said, I'm not rejoicing because you anointed me with three and one oil. I'm just rejoicing because you didn't anoint me with 10 W-40. That's all I <laughs> We got accused of getting anointed with 10 W-40, you know, and uh, so, but anyway, you got to watch that 10 W-40 now. That'll mess you up every time. Well, it's a wonderful thing to be here. I'm glad to be under the spout where the glory comes out. And uh, I feel like a teenager again this morning. I really do. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, please, in your Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And let's get right down into the nitty-gritty of everything. Deuteronomy 5. And uh, I, I, by the way, how's the sound to you this morning? Is it okay? Is it sound okay to everybody? Good. Wonderful. Deuteronomy 5. And uh, I'm going to start reading verse number 32. Now, if you mark in your Bible, I, I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to mark in your Bible. If you have never gotten in the habit of doing that, your Bible, my Bible looks like it bled to death in blue and red ink. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just mark. Any verse you underline or any note you make in the margin or anything that you uh, emphasize, when you come back through that, whether it's in a church service or whether you're just reading at home, it will rem remind you of what you heard on that passage. Yeah. Uh, so that you won't forget it. So here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Don't mark anything until I tell you. Uh, I'll tell you here in just a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse number 32. Everybody stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Buckle your seatbelt and hang on. We're going for a ride. I feel some preaching coming on right now. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse number 32. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live and that it may be well with you, and that ye may, and I want you to underline those three little words there, prolong your days. Prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Now turn the page. And notice now in verse number 2, uh, yes, uh, chapter 6 and verse number 2, notice. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and that, underline it again, thy days may be prolonged. Turn back about two pages. Uh, to chapter uh, number 4, and let's look in verse 26. Notice here, verse number 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it, Ye shall not prolong your days. There's that phrase, prolong your days. So he said, if you do certain things, you can live longer. You can prolong your days. If you do other things, you won't live as long. You shall shorten your days. You will not prolong your days. Now turn the page. I want you to notice verse number 40 now of chapter 4. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with and with thy children after thee, that thou mayest, there it is again, prolong thy days, underline it, prolong thy days upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Now, I want you to notice in chapter 5, in verse number 16, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged. There it is again, underline it again, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Hey, over and over and over in the, in the Bible, the Bible is very clear in telling us that God actually gives us the ability and the authority to live longer 
or to live shorter, depending on some things that we do. It's all through the Bible. For instance, Proverbs 3, 2, For length of days and long life and peace will I add unto thee. 1 Kings 3, 14, And I will lengthen thy days. Psalms 95, verse 16, With long life will I satisfy him. Exodus 9, 15, I will smite and thou shalt be cut off, meaning you will die younger or younger than you would have died. Now, God enabled us with certain inalienable rights, and our forefathers knew that, and they built that into our founding documents. And you have a right to life that God has given you, and you have a responsibility to live. Uh, My grandmother used to tell my mother, Mama said when I was growing up, I'd get depressed and angry and upset about life and everything in life. Said Mama, say, now Ruby, you can't die every time you want to now. You just can't die every time you want to. And uh, uh, so, but you know, we can control the length of time that we live and there's some ways that we can do it. How do we prolong our life? How do we shorten our life? You're about to find out. You're about to find out. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll bless us now. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. I pray, oh, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us now in a wonderful way. Uh, Lord, teach us the good things of God. Help us to know how to live longer and help us how to know, uh, live better and help us to how to understand how we can cut our life off short and we, our days will not be prolonged. Bless us, Lord, to understand it and to live and to have a desire to live. Lord, there's something wrong with people that don't want to live. There's something, they, they, they're malfunctioned. They're not thinking right. They're not doing right. Their heart is not right. To live, to life is a natural, normal thing and want to live. And I pray that you'll help us to know how to live longer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. Well, first of all, if you're going to live a long time, uh, you've got to do certain things morally. Look in verse 16 of chapter 5. You just read it here. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor, obey your mama and daddy. Or honor thy father and thy mother. Paul Raker was a great preacher in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He built uh, the great Faith Baptist Church over in Five Point section of Winston-Salem. I was a college student there. I lived there for some years. And... Um, he built this monstrous auditorium and housed the great uh, national Sword of the Lord convention every year. And he was a great man of God and a good preacher. But when he got about 50 years old, he called his children together and he said, Children, I'm going to tell you something that you won't understand and you won't like it, but it's the truth and I've got to tell you, I'm not going to live very much longer. And they said, Well, Dad, what makes you think not so? He said, Because of the way I treated my mom and dad because of the disrespect, because of the disobedience, because of the disgrace I brought them. He said, I won't live very much longer. The Bible is true uh, that uh, we can prolong our days by obedience to our parents and shorten our days by disobedience to our parents. And it wasn't long after that I had a heart attack and died. In 2005, uh, a group of friends, and I've got the article here on my outline, uh, if you'd like to see it afterwards, a group of friends went to pick up another friend who was a girl, And the mother, knowing who was coming to get her daughter, begged the daughter not to go. And uh, the daughter said, no, I'm going, Mom. So they finally came. She came out with her daughter, trying to talk her out of getting in the car. Well, when she got there, there were several in the car. I think it was five. She would have been the sixth one in the car. And when she got there, um, she saw they were all drunk. All of them were drunk, including the driver. And she begged her daughter, said, honey, don't get in that car. Don't get in that car. The girl got in the car. Her mom was still holding her hand. And she looked up real cocky-like and said, I'm going. And the mother, in desperation, said, well, if you're going, may God go with you. And embarrassed in front of her friends and cocky to her mother, she said these words. And I got it here on the, on the article. Said, if God, here's the exact word she said. And I'm going to let me read it to you, it says, Only if God travels in the trunk, because inside here, it's already full. A few hours later, they got word that car at a high rate of speed had hit a bridge in Button, killed everybody in that car, every single one. The officer said the car was so tore up, you couldn't tell what kind of car it was, and the entire thing was smashed and demolished, except the trunk. And they opened the trunk, and there was a, a 
crate of eggs, chicken eggs, in the truck, not a single egg was broken. She said, if God rides in the truck, God can go. Let me tell you something. You don't, you, you, God will ride where you allegate him to, but you'll pay the price. You'll pay the price. And God was proving to them and proving to us that you cannot allegate God to the back seat in the trunk of your life and do well. Disobeying your parents and the way she talked to her mother and the way she disgraced her mother and within a few hours she was in eternity. You don't prolong your life by disobedience. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and 16 and 17 there is a sin unto death. I do not say that ye shall pray for it. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty says for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. That means many are dead. And he talked to the church at Corinth and he said you're not doing well. You're weak, you're sick, you've got diseases and you're good, uh, going through a hard time and many of you are already dead because of the way you're living. Morally, you can shorten your life. Early. John Lennon, and many of you remember John Lennon uh, and his rock and roll outfit. During an interview with American Magazine, I heard this for years, but I didn't have the goods on it, but here, here it is. During an interview with American Magazine, he said, quote, Christianity will end, it will disappear. I don't have to argue about that. I'm certain it'll end. Jesus was okay, but his subjects were too simple. Today, we're more famous than Jesus. Shortly after that, he was murdered, shot six times. You don't exalt yourself above God. You don't put yourself above God and expect to prolong your life. Now think about it. Uh, you don't exalt yourself above the Word of God, and you don't disgrace the Word of God, and you don't spurn the Word of God and do it. Christine Hewitt, a journalist and entertainer, said, you know, I've got her quote here, the Bible is the worst book that was ever written. A few days after that, she was found in her car who had burnt up, and she was burnt so bad they had to use dental work to determine who she was. You don't spurn the word of God and prolong your days. You don't shun what God said and go on as if there's no God and no Bible and expect to prolong your days. Talking to Nevi, president of Brazil, coming up on an election, said if I get 500,000 votes, even God couldn't take me out of office. Well, he got his 500,000 votes. And just before he stepped into office, he dropped dead with a heart attack. Causa, composer, singer, and poet during a show in Rio de Janeiro while smoking a cigarette, stepped out in his cocky way and took a drag off of it and went, that one's for you, God. He died at the ripe old age of 32. You know how he died? Rotted away with lung cancer at 32 years of age. A disregard for the Bible, a disregard for parents, a disregard, a disregard for the man of God. Uh, 1 Samuel 26, 9, who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be get, get Let me tell you something. You see this guy right here? He puts his britches on like every other man in this room every morning. And he's not perfect. If you don't believe it, ask Michelle. She'll tell you. Amen? He's not perfect. But because God has called him to be pastor of this church, you better watch the way you treat him. You better watch what you say about him. And you better watch how you act toward him. And you better listen when he opens the Bible and preaches. I'm talking about how to prolong your life. Yeah. I got a preacher friend in Louisiana. And uh, he got up on a Sunday morning and said, Now, fellas, deer hunting season opens next Sunday, and I love to deer hunt. And I'm going deer hunting, but I'm not going next Sunday morning. I'm going to be in God's house. And let me encourage you, be, be in God's house. And he had a member of his church come up to him, young fellow, young ma married guy. He said, Preacher, just thought I'd let you know I'm going deer hunting next Sunday morning. With a smile on his face. He said, Deer season only comes around about once a year. And he said, I'm not going to let somebody else kill my big buck. I'll be in the woods next Sunday morning. Just thought I'd let you know. Well, the next Sunday afternoon, the pastor got a call from his wife, said, 
They got him down to the hospital trying to dig some mighty big buckshot out of his head. You may not always do everything this man preaches. You may not always achieve unto all the things he motivates you to achieve unto, but you sure better be careful how you act toward him. You sure better be careful, and that goes for any man of God anywhere. Disregard for God's man. Disregard for the sacred thing. You know, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 13, 9, that Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, and the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and he died. There's some things that are sacred. Some things that are sacred. The house of God is sacred. I'd be careful how I treated the equipment around here. I'd be careful how I threw paper down, kids, when you chew your gum. I'd be careful how I treated this place, this place that God intended for people to come here and, and hear the word of God and, and, and that, this place that was built with the sacrificial giving of God's people. I'd be careful about that. The house of God. You're not going to prolong long your life and do that. You're not going to prolong your not life and disregard the warnings of God. I'm telling you how to live longer. I'm telling you how to prolong your life. I could call the name of the church. I dare not. This, is this going on the internet? And it's going out live streaming probably and all that. I was preaching in a church, a large church. And I preached a sermon I'd only preached about three times. Matter of fact, I hadn't preached it in years. It's called Preaching Your Own Funeral. And I called ahead to the funeral home and asked if I could borrow a casket. And I called the, the staff of the church and told them what to do. And when they introduced me to preach, I stepped up and read my text, looked real somber, and sat down. And when I did, organ music began to play. And some good, well-dressed men brought that casket down the aisle. People didn't know it was empty. And they parked that casket in front of the pulpit, and I stepped up and preached a sermon called Preaching Your Funeral. And among other things, I said, before the week's over, you could be laying in that casket right there. I got a call a few days after that from the fella who went to the funeral home and picked the casket up and took it back. He said, Brother Brown, we had a young person in our church. This young person had been the star of our youth group. She was a wonderful girl but she backslid. And we tried to talk to her, and we tried to coerce her to come back. And in her rebellion, she would not come, and she was in that service when you preached that. And he said, you pointed your finger. I didn't know the girl. I wouldn't, I never did see her. I wouldn't, if you pulled her, put her face on the screen, I wouldn't recognize her. But anyway, he said, you pointed your finger back to her section and said, you could be laying in this casket before the week's over. He said, Brother Brown, that girl was killed before the week's over. And I went with the family to the funeral home, or met the family at the funeral home, and at their request, I went to them in the casket room. Now, I always did that as pastor, if, if the family wanted me to. Sometimes they opted out, that was fine. But just as a comfort, I'd go with them in the casket room. They're still grieving, they're still weeping. He said, I stood there. I'd never do anything. I don't make any suggestions. If they ask me about things, I'll, uh, I'll tell them, but... These are personal decisions families ought to be entrusted with. And he said they started around the room, walking slowly, discussing. The price is on each casket. They start out at, you know, just a felt box for $250, $300, and get up to seven dollars and $8,000, depending on what you get. And he said as they went around the room, they completed the circle and walked back and picked the casket that I had used in that service. And that girl's body laid in that casket before the week was over. There are certain things you can do to prolong your life. There are certain things you can do to shorten your life. But you don't disregard when God is trying to tell you something from the Bible. You don't disregard that and expect to live a long time. Disregard for the warnings of God. Disregard for God's house. You know, I, 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 was, 
I texted Keith Gomez this morning. I text preachers every Sunday morning. I text them something encouraging. And uh, I text Keith Gomez. He said, I just came out of Mexico. He preached for Kevin Wynn down there. And he said, I'm somewhere, Louisiana somewhere. I said, well, I'm in Missouri. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Illinois last week. Now I'll be in Wisconsin this coming week. And we were sharing some text. And uh, he said, uh, I had called him a while back and asked him about a story that I heard him tell years ago, and I wanted to get the straight of it. And he said, here's what it was. He said, it was a Monday morning. I'm sitting in my office. And he said, it's quiet. Nobody's around the church on Monday morning. And he said, it was quiet. And all of a sudden, I heard a man just wailing. Uh, I mean, it was awful. I could tell it was a man's verse, uh, voice. And he said, he was just wailing out. And he said, I, I got up and I thought, what in the world? And he said, I walked out of the church office. And when I did, that beautiful foyer to the church there, he said, I looked down the hall and one of those nice benches we have sitting along the wall, there was a man sitting on the bench and he had something in his hands. And he was throwing his head back just wailing, oh God, oh God, oh God. He said, I thought, what in the world? He said, I went down, walked up to him and said, when he saw me, he looked up and he said, you tried to tell me, you tried to warn me and I wouldn't listen. And he had a pair of little shoes in his hand. Here's what had happened. The man hadn't been saved too long, but he started to church, and he was faithful to church. And he heard the preacher say, be faithful, be faithful. Everybody has to miss church once in a while. If you've got 104 fever, have mercy on all of us and don't come. Amen. Stay home. If you, if you run the fever, don't give it to the rest of us. Stay home. There's nothing wrong with you going on a vacation, but when you go on vacation, you, about, you ought to include God on your vacation. Uh, and so, but everybody has to miss church once in a while. But he had some friends call him up and said, Look, we're going out to Lake, Lake Michigan. I want you to go out with us. He said, I knew they were drinkers. They were, had been my friends before I got saved. And I knew I shouldn't go. But he said, My little boy said, Dad, are we going to church? He said, No, we're going to have fun. We're going to fish today. And he said, We went out to the lake, and his little boy got caught in the undertow and drowned it. And he was holding his shoes, saying, You tried to warn me, and I wouldn't listen. If, we, if we'd have been where we're supposed to be and the boy had never drowned him, you don't prolong your life and you don't prolong the life of your family by doing so. I was standing in Lane Barlett Funeral Home with my pastor. I was assistant pastor at that time. I was standing beside of him over the body of a 28-year-old fellow or thereabouts, mid-20ish. His wife was standing beside the pastor and she was weeping. She said, Pastor, we live, only live four and a half hours from the ocean. And said, every weekend, instead of going to church, we go down to the ocean. And she said, we justified it by saying we work so hard all week and, and we'll go down there and just spend some family time together. Said he got caught in the undertow and drowned it. And she, I heard her say, if we, we knew we were doing wrong. We knew we were supposed to be in church. We knew that we were supposed to be in there. And we didn't do it. And she said, he would be alive if we had done the right thing and been in God's house. You better listen to me. You better listen to me. I didn't write in here on a load of pumpkins last night. And as you can tell already from the message, I didn't come to entertain you either. I came to tell you the truth. And disregard for the Bible, disregard for God's man, disregard for sacred things, disregard for the warnings of God, disregard for God's house. That's not the way you prolong your life. Let me give you another one right fast. Morally, you can prolong your life. Mentally, you can prolong your life. Mentally. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You need a check up from the neck up, some of you. Did you know I've read lists that insurance companies put out, health insurance and life insurance. And here's what they say. They give a list of all the things that happened to you and said if you don't overcome those, you won't live long. And none of them are drinking. They're things that happen to you that affect you emotionally and mentally. I walked in a restaurant, a greasy spoon restaurant one time, and here's what it said. It's not so much what you eat that gives you ulcers as what eats you. I thought that was a good one. There's three things that you can do mentally to prolong your life. Number one, direct your thinking. Direct your thinking. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Listen to what he says here. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. 
Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And the God of peace shall be with you, he goes on to say. Direct your thinking. 1 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations. Imaginations are mental pictures. Throw up, throwing down certain mental pictures and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Direct your thinking. This morning, as always we do, my wife and I went down to the breakfast area to eat breakfast this morning. And I got my bowl of oatmeal and Rhonda knew where I like to sit. I like to sit with my back to that television. You say, well, Brother Brown, about all that's on that time of morning news, I know, but that anchor woman sitting there with her dress hiked up to her elbows, I don't need to be looking at that before I come over here. I don't want that in my mind. I don't want to be sitting there gazing at that. I made a covenant with my mind with my eyes, why then should I look upon a maid? I work hard to control my thinking. I direct my thinking, direct my thinking. I'm amazed at how Christian people allow their minds to become a dumping garbage can. For every negative and filthy and immoral and horrible thought, direct your thinking. Here's another one. Plan your worry time. Plan your worry time. If you're going to worry, set a time each week, and that's your worry time. Don't worry until you get there, and don't worry after you leave it. Just all the things you're going to worry about, put it like Tuesday morning, 1030. Say, I, I, what are we going to do about next month's rent? Write it down, Tuesday morning, 1030. I'm going to worry about that. And don't worry about it until you get there. Do you know one man tried that? You know what he said? He said, well, I found out the majority of the things that I was worrying about, uh, I put them on, on whatever day it was, and he said, I, I found out when I got there, most of them was taken care of anyway. Amen. Did you know about 80% of all the things you worry about never happen? Just about 80%. And the rest of them are not worth... Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow takes thought for the things of themselves. Jesus said that. He said, live one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. I can trust God with tomorrow. Tomorrow. Here's another one. Direct your thinking. Plan your worry time. Number three, have a dumping station for stuff that you shouldn't be carrying around. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting, throwing all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Throw it, if I may do this. Throw it. Just throw it down. Get rid of it. It's too heavy for you to carry. 1 Kings 19, 7, God said to Elijah of all people. He got depressed. He was down under the juniper tree. Nobody's listening. I did my best. Nobody's listening. I, only I am left. And you know what? God said this. God said, I'm glad I got one cheerleader back there. God said this. <laughs> you say, preacher, did that bother you? Heavens, no. If you went in as many dead churches as I did, you'd just be glad to have some response from anybody back there. Amen? Yeah, that's right. Hey, thank God. Pinch him again. <laughs> that's good. Glad to have you. We love babies around our place. Amen? But here's what I'm saying. Learn to give up. Look, man on the bus. Standing with two big packages. He groaning and moaning. Been on there 45 minutes. The guy's reading newspapers. I said, sir, you got a problem? He said, yeah, this load's getting mighty heavy. He said, well, if you set it down, the bus will carry it for you. I mean, you say, well, that's stupid. That's how stupid we are. That's how stupid the Lord will carry it for you if you just give it to him. The Lord will carry it for you. So. Let me tell you something. There's three things you've got to have to live a long time. You've got to have something to believe in. You've got to have something to do. And you've got to have somebody to love. You've got to have those three things. Something to believe in, something to do, and somebody to love. And some of you are not in good mental health. 
You're not in good mental health. Mental health causes physical health to deteriorate. Mental health is, can prolong your life. Good night. You say, well, how are you so active at your age? Look, I'm four years from 80. And somebody say, oh, how can you be so active? How do you, well, it's a, a lot of it's my thinking. Don't come up here and tell me that I'm old. It may be true, but I don't want to hear it. <clears throat> I don't want to hear it. I was thinking a while ago, the brother got up here. I remember years ago down at Cedar River Baptist Camp. You know, I wish somebody heard, uh, remembers me from last week. You know, it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> I'm just picking up, brother. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, casting down imaginations. Controlling your mind. Controlling your mind. Um, you know, I did a study on people that lived a long time. Jenny Peterson. Jenny Peterson was a faithful member of my church. She was born in 1899. She lived through the 1900s. And in 2001, I preached her funeral at 102 years of age. So her life spanned three centuries. She was born in the 1800s, lived through the 1900s, and died in the 2000s. I preached her funeral. I wish you could have known Jenny. One of the most up little things you ever saw in your life, a little petite thing. And I'd pick on her. I, I came in one day, Jeannie, I heard you took up truck driving. You got your license and drive an 18-wheeler. Oh, no, not me. I'd carry on with her. She was, she was the most fun person in the world to be around. Hey, listen, lighten up. Get happy. You're going to heaven when you die. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Well, I'm getting old. I'm going to die. Well, you will. You keep thinking about it. You will. You, you really will. And... Uh, uh, you're, you're, look, my Aunt Daisy, my daddy's sister, died a couple of years ago at 99. I already had blocked out of my schedule to be, Rhonda and I was going to be at her um, 100th birthday party, and she died at 99. I wish you could have known her. One of the sweetest, upbeat women you ever saw in your life. Ne you never went in and said, hey, Daisy, how's it going? Oh, I don't know, Larry. I don't know. I never caught that. Not one time. I knew her all my life. Did you know my Aunt Daisy at 93, she was in her 90s, I think it was 93, was still delivering meals on wheels to the elderly. Yeah, at 93. Amen. Delivering meals on wheels to the elderly. And uh, it's all about the mind. It's all about the mind. I did a study about, uh, I mean, morally, you can prolong your life or shorten your life. Mentally, you can prolong your life or shorten your life. Let me just touch on this one. Physically, you can prolong your life or shorten your life. Physically. Give you a couple of illustrations and move on here. I was going down, when I, I started the Marion Avenue Baptist Church, and then after a few years, we had four or five children. And I was going down the street, and I ran into a farmer that I knew, a Christian man, and we got to talking about the cost of living, and I was telling him about insurance. And he said, yeah. He said, I'm with Farm Bureau. I said, well, I'm with Farm Bureau, but I'm with a special preacher's group. I said, they let me join that so we get a cut rate. He said, yeah, I'm paying. And he told me what he was paying. I said, hold the phone. That's not right. You're paying less than I am. He said, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not a preacher group. I'm just a member of Farm Bureau. I said, that ain't right. I said, I'm paying more than you are, and I'm in a preacher's group. He said, well, you can call the offices right down the street. So the next morning, I did. I called him. I said, told him what I ran into. And she said, yeah, he's one of our clients. I said, well, look, we have the same risk factors, same amount of children, same age. And I said, he's paying less than I am. She said, correct. I said, well, ma'am, that's crazy. I said, I joined this preacher's group out of Ottumwa. And I said, uh, these preachers don't smoke. They don't drink. And they don't do a lot of things these farmers do. She said, you're right. And she said, the smoking and drinking is not good for their health, but said these farmers get up early and stay up late and they work all day. And they, they are, they, they're physical. You preachers get up early and stay up late, but you have stress all day and you don't get any exercise and you're overweight and you got diabetes and you're a heart attack looking for a place to happen and you cost us more than the farmers do. So I dropped the farmers group, uh, the preachers group and joined the farmers group and saved money. Why not? 
Why not? Just because you're living a good life don't mean you're going to live a long time. There's certain things you got to do. My first wife died with cancer, breast cancer. So we're in Mayo Clinic. They're prepping her for radiation, chemo, and all of that. And uh, so this lady, doctor, Dr. Locke, was head of the radiation department. She had just met with my wife. My wife laying on the examining table. She just met with her, and she told us, now, what we're about, we're required by law to tell you what we're about to do, this radiation. It could cause your heart to stop, or it could burn your lungs out. Uh, it could give you lymph arm where your lung arm swells up and it would be that way the rest of your life. You'd have to tend to it. And then she gave us a long, morbid list of all these terrible things that radiation would do to you. And uh, so I whispered to my wife, I'm a witness to this lady. She was a very nice looking 38 year old lady, stylish but modestly dressed and head of the department. So when my wife left, I said, uh, ma'am, uh, Tell me, I found out she was a Seventh-day Adventist. And being a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew they eat very healthy. I said, ma'am, let me ask you a question. Uh, you, you folks eat pretty healthy. She said, yeah, we eat all organic. We do because we can afford it. And so everything we buy is organic. Uh, and she said, uh, uh, I said, well, tell me something. I'm playing dumb, you know. I said, tell me something. Do you think there's any correlation between eating right and prevention of cancer? Oh, yes. Now, wait a minute. This is the head of the radiation department at Mayo Clinic. I'll give you her telephone number. You can call her and ask her yourself. And she said, oh, yes. She said, our nutrition department here at Mayo Clinic has proven that eating four or five small servings of raw fruits or vegetables per day equals radiation in the prevention of cancer coming back. I about fell in the floor. It was all I could do to say, lady... Mayo Clinic, the biggest medical name in the world, has proven in their renewed nutrition department that eating four or five small servings of raw fruits or vegetables per day equals radiation in the prevention of cancer coming back from people who've had it. And you weren't going to tell me that? You were sitting on that and you weren't going to tell me that? You just got done telling my wife what you're going to do to her. Not only cost a quarter of a million dollars, and that's what it cost, $250,000. And it could kill her, cause her heart to stop and burn her lungs out, and you're sitting on something that will equal that, and you weren't going to say anything about it. You know what? So, Brother Brown, I didn't expect you to get on that this morning. I don't pass out a menu when I preach. You don't get to hear what you want. Uh, you just have to hear. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like cafeteria style. You just come down a uh, buffet, and I just glop it on your plate, you know. Uh, you say, well, I don't like what you just said. Well, we'll get something here in a minute you'll like better. Just hang on. You know, just, you know, don't, don't throw me out at this point, you, you know. Uh, by the way, did you know it is now proven that people that drink carrot juice and take barley green die healthier than people that don't? <laughs> yeah. Did you know Robert Mary McShane, one of the greatest preachers in the world, pastor in Dundee, Scotland, I stood in his pulpit. Rhonda and I stood in his pulpit. I was preaching in England and went to Scotland. Robert Mary Machine died at 29. Abused his health through schedule and the way he ate. And do you know what he said? And I can say it with the brogue, word for word, the brogue he used. I was given a horse. The horse was his body. And I was given a message to deliver. The message was the gospel. Alas, I have killed the horse and am not able to deliver the message and died at 29, one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. You and I have a message to deliver, and I got news for you. No matter how excited you are about living, when you die, you got to stop. You got to stop. You got to stop. Morally, mentally, physically, and then I close with this, spiritually. John 10, 28, eternal life I give unto them, and they shall never perish. Hey! How would you like to live eternally? Life and, and, and 
living life is the theme of this world. Body worshipers. Yeah. How would you like to live eternally? How would you like to be fixed so you could never die? You say, come on, preach. Hey, I'm telling you, seriously. Eternal life I give unto them, and they shall never perish. Shall never perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How do you live eternally? I'll tell you how you don't live it. I'm standing in, in uh, Subway, getting ready to order a Subway. And a rock and roll singer, he's over here, they're coming to the speakers, you know, and I try to tune that out, but I couldn't help. I picked up on this. Bon Scott singing Highway to Hell. And I can still hear him screaming, Highway to Hell, Highway to Hell. Hey, Mama, look at me. I'm bound for the promised land. Highway to Hell. Mocking the Bible, mocking God, mocking his parents, laughing about the fact he was going to hell. Hey, Satan, pay my dues, play it on a rocking band. Hey, Mama, look at me. I'm bound for the promised land. Highway to Hell, Highway to Hell. Just a few weeks after that, he choked to death on his own vomit from a disgraceful, sinful act we couldn't even allude to here. That's not the way you live eternally. I heard this right here was true. And I did a follow-up on it, and I found out some people stated it was true, and others said it wasn't, and the ones that said it wasn't was a, was a very favorite of the person that is claimed to say it. Her name was Marilyn Monroe. She was the icon of sensuality of my generation. And I heard that on a television interview show, she appeared with Billy Graham. And that Billy Graham told her, God sent me here to preach the gospel to you. And she listened to what he said. And when he got done, she looked at him and said these words, I don't need you. And I don't need your Jesus. Just a few weeks after that, she was found unclothed in her own bed, alone in her own house, dead from an overdose at the ripe old age of 36. You don't prolong your days by rejecting the gospel. You can't live forever. Oh, you live forever, but it won't be heaven. And the Bible says the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and cried for a drop of water. And he said, I'm tormented in this flame. At a trillion years from this morning, he'll still be there. And he can't get out. And Jesus don't want you to go there. He wants you to go to heaven and live forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And you can. You can. If only. You will receive him as many as received him. To him gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I close with this. I was teaching 250 teenagers on a Sunday morning. And I always gave an invitation. We had a girl and her boyfriend visiting that morning. She was about 17 years of age. And I, I had them all stand, had them with their heads bowed and asked people to raise their hand. It would like for me to pray for them to be saved. I could have touched her. I, I mean, right, she was, the seats were right near the platform. I could have almost touched her. And I had my hand stretched out. I said, wouldn't you come? I said, Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. If I could come back and drag you down here and get you saved, I would, but that, that don't work. You've got to be willing. Would you come? And I can still see her long brown hair. She's standing there with her jeans and her long brown hair and she shakes her head like this. A week and a half later, she and that boy were riding around on Halloween night. Somebody came by and threw eggs at the car, smashed all over the windshield. And her boyfriend said, pull over, fast. She pulled over. He said, I'm going to get those license and get the license number. He jumped behind the wheel, tried to catch him, high rate of speed. He dead centered a big oak tree. The week after that, one of the men that was on the rescue unit visited our church. He said, I understand so-and-so was in your class. I said, yes, she was. He said, I was the one that responded, one of several that responded. 
help get her out of the car. I said, I, I hear that it was bad. She, he said, it was about that much of her neck holding her head up, killing her instantly. And I can still see her standing there shaking her head, no, no, no. Let me tell you something. I'm going to live a long time, and I think I will, but I promise you this. I can't guarantee you I'll be alive to eat another bite as long as I live. I can't guarantee you that I'll come off this platform alive. I could drop dead right here and they could have to haul me out. But this I know, I know, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Heaven bound with a hammer down. Let me tell you something. I mean, listen, it's a wonderful thing to know where you're going when you leave this world. Do you know that? Can you tell me, I'm not afraid to walk out those doors because there was a time in my life when I personally received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know I'm saved. I don't mean you joined the church, got baptized, capsized, galvanized, or homogenized. I mean, you know you're saved. You did what the Bible says to go to heaven. What about it? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. I wonder how many